pleasure to welcome it's my very great pleasure to welcome Etienne and Beverly Wenger Trainer to this um, massive open online course, uh, the first steps into learning and teaching in higher education, 2012. Uh, Etienne and Beverly, uh, you, I think the the best thing to do is to hand over to you. Uh, we all know. Uh, some elements of your work, and some of us more familiar than others, and we're delighted that you could join us. So, let me uh, hand over the. Sorry, I need to. I need to make you moderators so that you can. So that you can. I've already done oh. that, George. Oh yeah, you've done that. Yes. Ah, yes, well I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and Jenny, you'll be in the room as a forum moderator. Marion, you'll monitor the chat. Sylvia, you'll monitor external channels. And I'll roam around and try not to make trouble. So thank you very much. Jenny's on the ball as usual. Over to you, Etienne and Beverly, please. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, so, um, what we thought we'd do is to give a brief introduction to our work, uh, the way that each of us uh, came into this field of social learning theory, to just give you a sense of, of what it's about. Um, and um, even though it is said that the question and answer uh, will be at the very end, for us we would prefer for the question and answer session to be ongoing. So um, we would love for, for this to become a conversation uh, rather than a presentation. So feel free to take the mic and um, uh, you know, engage with us. Uh, or to ask a question in the chat. Yeah. So why don't we start again by asking you, I mean, you're, you're well known for the theory of communities of practice and you're a social learning theorist. So how did you get into it? How did you get into this field? Well, um, I was invited actually to join an institute <laughs> called the Institute for Research on Learning, um, which was um, an institute started by the Xerox Foundation in response to um, to a Department of Education uh, report in the U.S. that uh, that was called the Nation at Risk. So the idea was that uh, um, you know education in the U.S. was was miserable, and uh, the idea of the institute was to rethink learning, was to uh, to reconsider uh, the assumptions that we are making about learning when we design institutions. Because the schools of education were going to do research on education and trans, uh, classroom stuff and, and so on and so forth. But the idea of John C. Brown who started this institute was that we needed to just rethink learning as a phenomenon on, on its own. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, a, a, that was quite interesting because he, uh, they decided to bring in people from different uh, disciplines, as you can see here. Uh, on the slide, the kind of disciplines that, that were represented. I was coming from computer science, sort of artificial intelligence, but there were people from anthropology, education, psychology. There were subject matter people who wanted to teach physics or teach math mathematics and so on and so forth. And um, it was really interesting because the whole thing started with a bunch of fights mm -hmm. over what does it mean to, to, to study learning, to study human learning. You know. To study learning without teaching. Without teaching, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so the idea here was to decouple learning, to not think of learning as a result of teaching, but to just look at learning as a phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, 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 of its own. And, and you know, like, like you know, uh, for, for an anthropologist, learning was very much becoming a member of a society, socialization. For a computer scientist, learning was very much, um, you know, creating information structures that responded to certain data. Mm -hmm. you know? So very quickly, the question was, what assumptions are you making about what is a learner? You know? mm -hmm. And so 
different, different uh, uh, disciplines were making very, very different assumptions about that. And so the, in the beginning, there were real fights. Because you had to come out with one conclusion? Well, we had to come up with a way to proceed uh -huh. and do research together, you know. So we had, uh, and actually the concept of community of practice, which is, uh, uh, um, you know, something that came out of these conversations and, 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 and this initial research, was a way to talk about learning is happening in the world, but also having certain processes, you know. Because, you know, a computer scientist would turn to an anthropologist and say, you know, your description of your little island is nice literature, but really it's not science because you are not talking about a process. We are not talking about something that can be reproduced, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas my little computer program that can reproduce a student's behavior on some subtraction is an actual science, scientific statement about learning, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so I started to work with an anthropologist, her name is uh, Jean Lee. Uh, she had studied apprenticeship uh, in Africa among tailors, and we were uh, studying different cases of apprenticeship uh, uh, around the world, and we noticed that um, the learning is often not taking place in direct relationship with the master, because often people think of apprenticeship as a relationship between a student and a master. But in fact, in many of these historical cases, the learning was taking place among apprentices at different levels of advancement. Mm -hmm. And so that group around a master where there was a curriculum for, uh, 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 for a newcomer to uh, go through different stages, that's what we call a community of practice. So in fact, the term was born very simply in these studies of apprenticeship. And the reason we are interested in, in apprenticeship is because apprenticeship is, is, is an age-old uh, uh, learning process. Uh, it is usually fairly successful. You, you finish your apprenticeship unless some major thing happens. Um, and it is teaching light, if you will, in the sense that the apprentice is kind of entering that community of practice and kind of absorbing what's happening there uh, over time. Yes, Jenny. So, yes, Jenny. Hi, Etienne. I hope I'm not Hi, Etienne. I hope I'm interrupting you too early. Interrupting you too early. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Um, I, I'm interested um, in this. I, I'm could, you, could you turn your mic off, somebody? <laughs> Thank you. I'm interested in this split between teaching and learning, and I'm just wondering if um, the work with apprentices um, and the learning between apprentices and the work that came out with the different disciplines that you were doing, in, if in any way there was a sense of devaluing the role of teachers. Well, not really, um, because w what we wanted is not to assume that learning is the result of teaching. That doesn't mean that, you know, I, I mean, in, in, in many of the cases of apprenticeship that we were looking at, actually the master was a, had a very important role, uh, if, if only to bless the participation of the of the apprentice, um, not at all. A, a, as a matter of fact, um, you know, we were hoping that our theories would actually improve teaching and improve the work of schools and and institutions of learning. But we 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 didn't want to simply say that learning was a phenomenon of transmission between a teacher and a student. So that's an interesting question because maybe that's why it's taken so long for education to come into social learning compared to, say, business. Because perhaps all the structures are up for a certain way of teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, social learning theory does, I think, challenge the, uh, challenge the role of the teacher, the traditional role of the teacher. I think it challenges the role of the teacher as a transmitter of curriculum mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think it doesn't challenge the role of a teacher as a as a person who has an identity of participation in a certain practice and can open that identity to students so that they can kind of explore what it's like to be a member of that of that community. No, but it's easy to say, but not so easy to test. That is right. Yeah. Okay, okay. So so we have to institutionalize that and, and, and create the structures. I think I think we still don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. To be to be fair, yeah. mm -hmm. so Jenny, is that? That's great, Etienne uh, and Bev. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, uh, so actually, it was business. Who then, actually, before we go on, maybe you should just briefly, for those people who don't know, say what is a community of practice? Well, a community of practice is is. Uh, um, a kind of learning partnership, if you will, among people who share an interest, uh, you know, a, a problem that they, they have to address. They interact with each other in some circumstance. It could be online, it can be face-to-face, -face, uh, it could be over this kind of technology. Uh, they interact in some ways and help each other uh, make progress on the thing that they were trying to achieve. So, you know, a committee of practice can be, a, you know, a group of engineers trying to figure out how to design better brakes for, for a car. It could be a, a, a bunch of young people on the street forming a gang to survive and to develop an identity they can live with in a, in a society that they feel is hostile to them. So the idea of a committee of practice can actually be applied to many, many circumstances. And it was interesting because even though the concept was born out of studies of apprenticeship, then we started to see the phenomenon in all sorts of circumstances where there was no formal uh, process of apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, actually it was commercial, the, the, the commercial world who first took up the idea of communities of practice. So now, now it's become almost, almost institutionalized in companies. That is right, that is right, actually. Uh, at the time, you know, uh, businesses were um, struggling with the issue, of the challenge of managing knowledge as an asset. Right? And they were doing this very much technologically by building big knowledge bases, uh, big knowledge no databases, and so on and so forth. Um, so for them, the concept of community of practice was kind of a, a different way of thinking about how knowledge exists in an organization, that you have all these self-organizing informal communities and networks that people have formed to learn how to do what, what they need to do. And, um, and so that, that gave people in business both a way to, to think about knowledge as existing in the social fabric of the organization, but also then uh, uh, practically to say, okay, if we can support these communities, if we can give them a voice, if we can, you know, give them more resources and so on and so forth, we may be able to actually develop the knowledge of the organization uh, in, a, in a social context. So yes, you know, uh, uh, you can see uh, all sorts of um, um, commercial organizations from, you know, Petrobras and, and Shell were early in the game uh, uh, of, of developing large communities of practice across uh, 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 across the world, basically, uh, it shall. If you have, if you are uh, engaging on, on, a, on a project, you have a question. It's become part of the culture to ask that question of your community, and for people to provide help. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, they, they call it. They call it uh, ask, learn, uh, share, and win, or something like that. But it has become part of the culture. Mm -hmm. that you belong to a community and people help each other solve problems. Uh, um. And so, somebody's asking in the chat how specific the interest has to be to be of any value. So they're talking there about the domains. Well, I think, I think you have different realizations of that. Uh, I would say, yeah, the communities are fairly large, like, like well, engineering is a community. Uh, that has been going on for a long time there, and 
that's a fairly large community, about 700 people. Uh, they have some groups for, for certain topics, but they also have questions that, that just go out to the entire community. At Caterpillar, they have much smaller communities, much more focused on, on a certain problem, a certain piece of uh, uh, equipment that tends to break or something like this. So it can be realized in different ways. What's important is that the, the domain has to be specific enough that people can actually talk about the practice and, and the actual problems that they are facing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, somebody's also asked about uh, informal and formal, whether they should be informal or formal, and brings up the, the, the question of um, organizations using it as a form of control. I, I would say in my experience that if an organization does try and use it as a form of control, it just won't work. So they'll be hugely disappointed. But in terms of formal or informal, actually we've seen, we've seen every different variety of the community of practice, from the totally informal to the very formal. And in fact, maybe you could talk about how McKinsey uh, does it. Well, what they have there is that they have different levels of formality mm -hmm. for communities. So they have lots of of communities of practice and networks that are completely self-forming uh, and, 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 you know, just informal conversations among, uh, among people and so on and so forth. Then they have different uh, 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 ways that the community can get support from their organization if they, uh, for instance, want to develop some, some business capability that are, that are important, or the way to uh, recognize so-called practices that are then invested in and, and, and developed, uh, like uh, an example would be strategic use of IT, you know, that's one of, the, of those communities that it has been now uh, established and recognized as a, as a formal practice. Right, it's a formal practice which means that they are accountable to the organization. But maybe that, right. uh, maybe what's different is that there in the organization, it's people who see the need for a community of practice and then they get support for it. It's not the boss saying, all right, let's form a community of practice around this to make this happen. But I think it, it could happen both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 In fact, because often it, 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 it depends. That question is a really subtle one of, of um, somebody using a community of practice or a boss using a community of practice or management using a community of practice for control. But there are many, what we see is many, well, managers or conveners who see the need, see that if they open a community of practice, some great things could happen. And so they do it for that reason. But if they do try and control it too much, it will die. That's right, yeah. But it doesn't mean that it can't work. Yes, it, it can be started informally by people coming together, or it can be started by an organization suggesting to a few leaders in the domain to, to form a community of practice. In the end, it's still the practitioners themselves who are, who are running their own learning process, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it, actually, we're talking here just about companies, but... Uh, Community of practice happen in lots of different um, places now in different sectors. So yes. you're doing some work with Singapore government. Yeah, there, there they are using uh, community of practice as a way to, uh, to to create learning across the silos of agencies. Uh, like they have recently studied a community of practice on international relations, and um, uh, you know. Most, or most agencies today in a place like Singapore have to interact with the rest of the world. And so uh, they have a community of practice for people who are not uh, uh, diplomats, but who still have to engage with other, uh, other countries and learn from each other how to do that. Mm -hmm. And the mess of my work takes place with um, international development agencies. So, for example, SADCAPAC, who's there in the middle, that's a... Uh, that's a community of practice of parliamentarians in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. And they come together to get 
they're, they're, they're parliamentarians who are concerned with public accountability and public resource management. And they, it's a practice that needs developing, needless to say, and uh, people come together to see how to get better at doing yeah. it. And that was, in yeah. fact, Yes, I'm just wondering whether um, you think that the uh, uh, community of practice in an education sector or in an education setting has different characteristics or specific characteristics that are different to the, the communities that you're describing here on this slide, which seem to be more corporate communities. I notice you do have connected educators there, and of course, scope is a, or you've got actually Lancaster Man University Management School as well. But are there are the same principles in place, or are there specific characteristics for an education community of practice? Well, our experience is, is that actually it is fundamentally the same principle. Um, and it would be interesting to hear Sylvia tell a bit of the story about school. But I think before we do that, I think it would be worth letting uh, uh, Bev finish the story about this, this, this African. Uh, uh, <laughs> community, uh, but that was that was convened in, in terms of like who convened it. That was actually convened by the Supreme Audit Institution in Tanzania, who saw that there was a need for their own parliamentarians to uh, to get better at transparent practices, and set up a, a network between them and other parliamentarians in in East Africa, and then did the same in Southern Africa. And then they decided as two successful networks to come together as a community of practice. And I think it is, re it is remarkable that, uh, that the world of international development is starting now, slowly, to adopt processes like this. Because if you think of, of, of learning you know, the planetary process, traditionally learning has been viewed as a very vertical process of the North telling the South what to do, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And now to see that, that organizations like the World Bank are ready to sponsor, to sponsor this network, I think it's really a, a, a shift in, in the understanding of, 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 of what learning means, even at the planetary level. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think somebody asked about uh, community different from networks. Okay. Um, I think that, that we prefer to use a distinction between community and network as a, a distinction between forms of relationship w within a group. So a group is both a community and a network most of the time. Uh, network refers more to the in interaction and the, the connections between people, and community refers more to the common identity that people form. So most communities are also networks uh, because you know, people create connections with each other, and many networks also have a community aspect, what people call network, has a community aspect because there is a strong sense of identity among them. You know? So uh, this parliamentarian that you work with in Africa they call themselves a network, but in fact they have a strong sense of identity mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah. You know, so I think it's important not to not to not to worry too much about what, what, what people call themselves, but more to understand what are the processes that allow people to learn together. But Jenny, in a way, your question I think is um, is is interesting in the sense that. Like education has been one of the last ones to take up the idea. And where it has taken up, where it has got traction, is professional development among teachers. And so the idea of community practice or social learning has come about at that level. And a number of people do struggle as to, like, what does this mean for my actual classroom? So my classroom practice, as opposed to me as a, me in a professional development type of community. So, for example, in, that, um, in terms of education, but in professional development, the processes are very similar, whether it's education or, 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 or companies, 
Uh, I mean, they're different things like teachers have a different rhythm. Um, and uh, but, but apart from that, many of the, most of the processes I think are the same. Although I do remember reading on your blog once that you thought it was different. So it would be interesting to hear what you think. Um, yes, I, um, <laughs> now you've put me on the spot here, Bev. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to remember what that blog post said, so I don't contradict myself. In your blog post, you said that uh, you said that when you heard people in companies um, uh, telling their stories, you thought, "Duh, we've been doing this in education for a while." So. Yes, I I think the, yes, I, it's the business about social learning, and I think that happens intuitively almost in in most education circles. Although I know that there's this transmission um, approach between teacher and learner can can happen. I th I think that um, the difference that I see it, and when I've talked to people who are organizing corporate um, community of practice is that they tend to be oriented around um, organization of resources that will help to solve specific problems, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, rather than a discussion in which learning emerges. Is that incorrect? Um, yeah, it tends to be driven by specific problems. Uh, I would not say that it is less learning just because it is driven by specific problems people need to solve. Um, because you know people brainstorm together on, on 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 how to solve a certain issue or how to deal with a certain kind of client, um, or, or you know. So yeah, it is. It is driven by practice, and because the practice of of, of these people is to solve problem, uh, then they, they they talk very much about how to do something, you know, or explore. It. But, but but we were at Godard, for instance, in Brazil, and uh, one of the community of practice had taken on the task of um, thinking through the use of a new kind of technology to to melt steel. So. It was very much sort of learning about that new technology, learning who is, was using it, who, uh, what, what problems they had, and so on and so forth. And, and, and this community was just like really on, a, on, a, on an exploratory journey to, to think through the use of, of the new technology for, for heating uh, furnaces. So it was a lot of learning for them. Uh, it was driven by the desire to to uh, save energy uh, in in the heating of steel, but it was it was certainly a learning expedition. And that I mean that's that was the, that's the same sort of idea behind uh, Iowa, the education uh, group in Iowa in the U.S. I mean there there was a specific problem in inverted commas, which is this idea of uh, one computer per child. So every every child having a computer, and then teachers saying, well, we're not ready for this. We need to get, to get together and see how we can, how we change our classroom practice now that this new thing of, one, uh, of computers in the classroom is here. So that was the same idea of we've got this problem or challenge. Let's work out how to, um, how to do it better. It might be good to hear from Sylvia, actually, uh, uh, if she thinks that her scope uh, community that she's been running for many years um, is is kind of specific and, and different because it's it's uh, uh, you know populated by educators. Okay, Sylvia's so here. I, I, can try, I have to say, um, I, I, I had a power failure, say, so um, I just came back to the room, so I haven't completely been following the conversation. Um, and I just have to add that George at the beginning said that you can leave if there's a fire alarm, and just by coincidence, I did have my smoke alarm go off in the process. So 
anyway, yes, I, I mean, with, with the Scope um, online community, and I see you have a little badge on your slide there from Scope. Um, we've been um, running this community since 2005, but it actually has a longer history than that. It goes back to 1999. Um, when we started a community called the Global Educators Network. And we actually started that community without even using the word community. We just needed a, a way for people to get together online and talk about their research. Um, so what's, what's evolved over the years with the SCOPE community is, is basically um, we rely completely on volunteers. Um, the topics that we host and the, the monthly discussions we host in the community um, all come from the members. Um, so there's really no, there's very little, um, you know, top-down administration or, or um, there's, it, we just let things happen. We don't panic if we have a month where no topics emerge. <laughs> um, and we're just very informal and, and uh, you know, not, we don't worry, worry too much about um, appearances. If things don't go well, well, that's just part of, part of how a community of practice should run, and that's our attitude toward it. I think that's really um, what has um, made it successful, is that uh, we don't fret too much. We just we just let things happen, and we really listen, listen, listen to the members. So I hope that is in context, because um, I am kind of jumping in sideways and not really understanding the full context of the question. And, and what proportion would you say of, uh, of your topic are sort of challenge driven and uh, what proportion are just uh, more like curiosity about something? Um, well, um, well, I think the most successful discussions that we've had are from facilitators who have volunteered because they want to learn themselves about the topic. So. Um, you know, a good example is when Google Wave was was uh, was big. Remember those days? <laughs> it wasn't so long ago. Um, and and somebody was curious about you know how we could make that work for different um, different scenarios in education and and in professional learning communities of practice. And and so she took it on to you know to to actually learn herself and experiment and have a group of willing participants you know to experiment with. And so um, that's the type of conversation that I think is really successful. Um, some of the other uh, seminar topics, discussion topics that haven't been so successful were more people maybe wanting to promote their own work a bit. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if somebody's written a brilliant book and wants to share it, then, then that's a great way to do it. Um, but they're not always as, as vibrant and well attended. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, there was uh, uh, some questions in the chat about uh, uh, power and people kind of co-opting the notion of community of practice, um, and that is that is true. Um, I don't think I don't think that's necessarily bad, though, um, because if organizations need to to put the learning that needs to take place in the hands of practitioners. I think that's that's an interesting development. Um, and if you take communities of practice seriously, in some sense you have to let go of control. Like Beth was saying, uh, uh, you can't you, you can't run a community of practice the way you run a business unit or a team. Um, by assigning people roles and, 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 and their lives and so on and so forth. It's, it's well, you can try, but then people just don't do it. Right, right. And so, um, I, I don't think that communities of practice are really sort of changing relationships of power with, uh, within organizations, but they are um, giving people a voice in, in new ways by, um, by recognizing the knowledge that exists in practice. And, and and encouraging people to connect around uh, around that knowledge. So I think it is making a difference. Uh, yes. Uh, may, I, yes. May, I may I May I interrupt? I was just 
Um, I, I certainly think that communities of practice have been an extremely effective uh, way of understanding how knowledge permeates organizations. And I, I, I guess the, the issue for me isn't so much whether or not um, they are co-opted by powerful organizations. Of course, they will be, and powerful organizations are, are often very uh, intelligent organizations. You cite Shell in the past. But one wonders to what extent um, the you know, should the community of practice conclude that there were better ways of doing these things that was not directly in the shareholders' interests, would the, would the community of practice survive or would the uh, institution um, either marginalize that particular community, the, the organization marginalize that particular community? So I guess there, there are to me issues of community of practice being an extremely enlightening uh, tool of analysis and tool of understanding and indeed a very effective way of organizing the um, both tacit and explicit knowledge that exists in the people who do the work in organizations. I guess I just worry that there has been a sort of a, a, a big rush into it by the big organizations and at, at some point if they find that it is no longer in their interests, that the communities may lose the support that they are currently finding. I think that, that, I think that is true. Uh, um, well, first of all, I, I, I think that communities of practice will always exist in organizations, whether the organizations uh, recognize it or not. So, because there were, uh, there were communities of practice in organizations before the term was used, um, so, that is true. Um, I'm trying to think of a case where a committee of practice was working against the interest of the shareholders. I can't, I can't think of a concrete case wh where I've seen that, um, but I'm sure that if that was the case, then the committee would be... Um, well, yeah, in terms of, here we're talking a lot about organizations, but in the work that I do, communities of practice are very much challenging often national structures or vertical structures or or not necessarily challenging but um, not always challenging but being at the intersection between uh, being a community and the vertical one. So for example um, there at the bottom the CGIAR that's uh, intellectual property for agricultural products in developing countries and that was people coming from different countries in Africa and, and South America uh, to work on intellectual property, on agricultural products. And within their own country, they're not very strong. They're a sort of a lone voice. Very often, their own institutions are not that interested in, in, in the issue. But coming together, they became much more informed. They got much more legally um, adept and much better at challenging big companies who are coming into their into their country and not respecting the intellectual property of the of local populations, so there was a clear way that the community of practice became much stronger um, to to challenge the vertical. Uh, and I would say that that's even with the uh, parliamentarians that I work with, there they are combating corruption on quite a big scale within their countries and within their countries you know some of them even you know have death threats but they have when they're coming together across um, the region they they feel much stronger and get much better at challenging the practices in their own country so I mean I, all, I would say a lot of my examples are of where the community of practice is challenging the some of the vertical structures that are that, that are happening, and actually, even in the way that that the meetings are organised, right? That that traditionally they've had like lots of dis lots of speeches by important people, mm -hmm. and the way that you work with them is by creating more horizontal connections mm -hmm. among parliamentarians and clerks and and, and, and and people at different levels in the hierarchy we are really working together. So mm -hmm. that was also challenging, uh, mm -hmm. even within the meeting, mm -hmm. the way that hierarchy was being expressed 
mm. uh, in the relationship among people. Mm. Somebody asked a question uh, about uh, working with different cultures uh, and if that, was, if that was in any way different. And I think, I mean, that's an interesting question. Of course, when you go and work with community practice in different countries, we've done it in Asia, Africa, and, uh, and other places, there are always like rather, there are always sort of like cultural things like, you know, how you dress, the time you start. There's some, what I would think of as rather superficial differences. But actually, once you get people, if you get people who are passionate about doing something, underneath it all, <laughs> we're pretty much the same as human beings. Uh, in wanting to resolve it and work together to, um, to, to tackle it. So I would say that cultural, cultural issues come up when people are not that passionate about the domain. Then cultural things become, and linguistic things become more important. But when people are really together to do something together, everything else falls apart and we're the same underneath. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that actually one of the parliamentarians had told you that the method that you were bringing, mm -hmm. uh, com com coming from the West, were actually in line with traditions over there. Right? Yes, that's right. He was, he was an elderly man, one of the elders, and he stood up at the end of one of the meetings and said, thank you very much, you have reminded us of how we, how we know how to do it well. So, yeah. Yep. Great. So, um. I was just wondering. No. I was just wondering about the uh, relationship between an individual's identity and the community of practice, because presumably any one individual might be a member of multiple communities of practice and how they sort of negotiate um, their membership in any one community of practice with. You know, how they deploy different parts of their identity in order to make particular communities work. Well, I mean, this is precisely where we live in an interesting world, and actually that's something we're hoping to come to uh, uh, a bit later in the, in, in the conversation, um, where we actually live at the crossroad of many, many communities, and uh, what what that suggests is that um, um, the, the development of an identity of knowledge ability is is a process of negotiating how you navigate the world of of practice and the world of different communities. So uh, yeah, if maybe we should just move on with the uh, um, with the presentation because I think we, we, we're going to get there. Um, but there is a very interesting relationship between individual identity and community in terms of, of, of the different ways that knowledgeability is being carried over time through the world. So you can imagine the world as, as this set of practices run by communities and individuals kind of traveling through that, through, through that, that space. Yeah. Um, And I think it would be also interesting, from the point of view of higher ed, uh, to hear Bev's uh, uh, trajectory into this work. Um, but right, but somebody needs to let go of the slides so that we can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so please don't move the slide. Um, because you, you came through to, to this notion of, of practice and communities. Uh, through genre analysis in, in the, in, in well, the context yes. of, of teaching English. Exactly. I, was, uh, I used to teach English for specific purposes and English for academic purposes in universities in Portugal. Can somebody stop losing the slides? <laughs> uh, and we got, um, at that time, that was before I even knew about communities of practice, but me and my colleague, Sally, Sally Mesa, we, we were very interested in analyzing genre. 
It's a bit disconcerting when someone keeps moving the slide. Yes, please do not move the slide. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, in analyzing genre, what we were what we were looking at was um, looking at different conventionalized or institutionalized things, um, genres, uh, in the context of a of an institution, in the in the context of a profession, to see how. Communities, uh, how discourse communities, which is what we called them at that time, uh, how discourse communities used genres to achieve their to achieve their goals, and we were very interested in um, analysing the genre to see how we could best design a course for students who were learning English for specific purposes or for academic purposes, and we created a, a, um, a design framework for, um, for, our, for our courses, which required looking at, studying, researching the concept, what we call the conceptual universe of the students and where they were going to go mm. into communities, professional communities that they aspired to. And you, you, you were, for instance, uh, uh, engaging business students in developing um, presentations of of a, of a, of a business uh, um, um, proposal or something like this, as a as a way to to anchor their learning of the language in a genre of 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 a practice. Well, that's right, because then we are, that, so students. Well, in fact, our, I mean, the, the, what the framework did was. Um, what, what we did was research a project mm -hmm. which would be typical of a genre that students aspired to um, engage with. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in, with our business students, they had to present a business plan for a new business in Portugal that they could convince international people would be a good idea to invest in. So we brought in to assess it, we, we invited uh, people from the outside, so for example the business um, correspondent for the Financial Times, the, the Portuguese business correspondent for the Financial Times, we invited him to come and listen to the, to the business proposals that people did. And uh, we designed the, the course and all the activities around preparing people to engage in that genre and stretch their minds like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think this is really interesting because sometimes people think that the implication of this theory for education, higher education, for instance, is, is like cooperative education, where you send you send people, um, you know, into into the workplace for a couple of weeks or something like this, which is which may be a very interesting experience. But what what you are saying here is that understanding the genre. Of a the genres of a practice, and making sure that the course is designed to actually engage students with a job may be actually more important than sending people on a little internship or something. Right. So to get people comfortable in one part of the genre, so the community that they aspire or possibly aspire to belong to, and getting them to be strategic in the use of that genre. Mm -hmm. as a sort of meta skill uh, was the way that we saw it. So that was very much, that became, an, and there we integrated the theory of communities of practice because we, it became very helpful. But there, yes, instead of saying, how can we get students to go and be apprentices in real communities, mm -hmm. let's help them to engage in the genre that those communities use and help them to become strategic about using it. Interesting, because that, that, that really helps uh, make sense of, for instance, uh, I was in Hong Kong um, a few weeks ago, and in, at the University of Hong Kong, uh, they have a new initiative called Experiential Learning Initiative, and what they would like to do eventually is to have 
uh, um, all the all the discipline take an experiential approach to learning um, and what they're doing now is they're starting with the professional schools because it's, it's, it's a bit more concrete to do there. But like for instance, in the, in the School of Architecture, uh, a large part of the work of the students is to be involved in a real project, like they go into a, a rural village uh, in, in, in mainland China and um, they build a school. Mm. And so the students are involved in all the sort of political, technical, social, ethical questions involved in actually building a school in a rural village uh, who, whose opinion to listen to. They go in, they interview, they interview villages and, 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 and people about what they, what, what they would like and so on and so forth. And so that's a project run by the university uh, that the students um, uh, get involved in. And, and, and in some sense, the university has chosen a kind of typical genre of, mm -hmm. of the profession that these, the, the, the students are aspiring to and giving them the full experience, mm -hmm. which they may actually not have if they went into, uh, uh, into an internship where they would be maybe be doing menial, menial work and not be really uh, engaged with the, with the full genre. Mm -hmm. So that, that, I think that, that, that notion of, of paying attention to the full genres that exist within the practice and then saying how can an educational uh, enterprise kind of reproduce that, I, I, I think that's actually an inter very interesting way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're just reading the questions. Oh, there, there's so many questions where I can have. Uh, some. Yeah. But now that we, that now that we are uh, uh, telling stories, it might, it might be good to tell the stories of this work that we were doing with. Um, with the Open University in the UK, um, where um, they were asking us uh, about uh, how to think through um, um, the kind of professional uh, teaching that they were doing in the university. Um, well, experiential learning what the, uh, I'm responding to a question in, 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 in the chat here. Experiential learning, I think what they mean by that is an authentic experience of being engaged with a genre of, of, of the practice. Um, so, yes, it does mean practice, but it means uh, having the full experience. So, you know, for, for them, going through the whole process of designing and building a school and taking, taking the, seeing the, pro, the, the whole project through is, it's interesting to, to hear actually there's a little video that, uh, that if you look at the University of Hong Kong, uh, there's a little video of, of, of what students say about how transformative that was for them to actually engage in that full project. So yes, it, it has, it has very much to do with practice because it's almost understanding the DNA of the practice and then creating an experience by which, by which students will actually engage with, with what, what, what Beverly was talking about, uh, uh, within a practice. But anyway, so, uh, we're talking with the Open University, and also the, of course the Open University has been uh, uh, very good at creating curriculums and uh, uh, delivering those curriculums through, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a system of distance education. Uh, they actually invest a lot in the creation of a curriculum when they, when they start a new course. Um, and 
this the picture that you see is a, is a picture of, of uh, uh, that represents a, a story that I had with a friend of mine who was a lawyer and said, "Oh, this is the body of knowledge of my profession," you know, and. From the perspective of this theory, the body of knowledge of a profession is not just a curriculum and you will not be able to, you know, this idea that the body of a profession is a curriculum that you can put in students' head in the, in the um, context of a classroom and then going into the world is just applying this curriculum that, has, that, that, that you have uh, put in your head. In fact, if you think of, of, uh, if you think of the body of knowledge of a profession, for instance, it looks much more like what we would call a landscape of practice. So where you have different, uh, uh, different practices uh, attempting to influence uh, what happens in, in a profession. For, Take a teacher, for instance, right? So there is teacher training. So you go through a university process, and the university is really hoping that it's going to uh, influence what you, what you are doing as a teacher. But there, is, there are also research disciplines that are, are also uh, putting out papers. Um, there, is, uh, there, is, there, is, there is a professional body that is, uh, uh, um, you know, defining sort of uh, uh, the ethics of the profession and so on and so forth. There are re regulatory bodies that, that uh, uh, define maybe competences that need to be developed by students and so on and so forth. There's a workplace where you, maybe your principal or, or the CEO of your hospital uh, uh, wants you to, to do certain things. So really what, what creates the, the knowledge of a profession is a, is a complex social uh, uh, system, we call it a, a landscape of practice, in which uh, uh, you know, a professional like the one that you see on the slide is, uh, is, is, is acting. Um, so these different practices uh, uh, within a profession may not agree with each other. You know? So there is, you know, uh, the professional body, uh, the regulatory body may say, oh, you have to give this test, but the, dis the research discipline is saying, oh, we don't know if this test is really useful or if it, if, it, if it does the job. So there are all these different vectors and forces within a landscape of practice, and a person, a professional, really has to negotiate that into a moment of service to a student or to a, to a, to a patient or, or to a client, and you can think of, of the knowledgeability of a professional as this kind of dance of, of renegotiating a complex landscape of practice into useful moments of, of, of engagement um, with recipients of, of, of services. So why don't you say what we did at the Open University? Yeah. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so uh, it's interesting because... <laughs> um, so what we did actually um, was to bring together uh, for a meeting uh, people, people who were coming from that landscape for different professions. Uh, uh, what do we have? Uh, so we have education, healthcare, there was business also. Business as well. Yeah, and, and, and social uh, services, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we, we engaged people in telling stories across uh, of sharing stories across those boundaries. So, uh, you know, if somebody came from the regulatory body and somebody was a, 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 a child minder or a, 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 ch a, a child care person, they, were, they reenacted, for instance, an inspection of a, uh, of a child care facility. And um, it, was, it was interesting uh, for them to explore the position, their position within the broader landscape. Um, I think something that, that they all um, discovered is how much they had themselves traveled through the landscape. We had also an exercise where we allowed them to, to, uh, uh, to walk through the landscape and describe their own travel through the landscape. Um, and 
uh, and sometimes we would w a trajectory for higher ed would be to take the landscape very seriously and to take this notion that we developed our identity across multiple practices very seriously to give them like a visa, like an example of that actually I remember in Australia we were, we were having this conversation also about that and some group that was training uh, the police was saying that an important thing that they do is to go live with a family in a neighborhood for a few weeks as a, as a host, uh, as a guest, you know, and kind of explore the different perspective in the landscape that way. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so learning is becoming a series of boundary encounters. If you start looking at at uh, learning across a landscape, then the learning moments are those moments, are those times where you interact at the boundary of the practices across the landscape. That's why, right. that's why, right. where boundaries become more like pedagogical devices, you know, um, to, to help students develop an identity that's related to the whole landscape and not to just one location in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the slides also show that the landscape is becoming also more complex uh, today because um, there are all sorts of new entrants, mm -hmm. you know, in, into the, the traditional landscape uh, uh, with um, NGOs and uh, <laughs> Google, Wikipedia, communities of practice, you know, uh, 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 you know um, clients, uh, patients, they form communities. We've, we've seen some communities of practice of patients who discuss uh, what they're doing with their doctors and who sometimes know about research even before their own doctors through their community of practice, uh, online communities of patients. Um, and so I, I, think, I think we live in an interesting world, right, where, um, where, where knowledge ability is defined in much more complex ways. Because if you're a doctor, you, you prescribe a medicine to your to your uh, uh, patient, and your patient says, well, in my community we discussed it, that idea last week and everybody's getting headaches from it or something like this, you know what I mean? So that's, if you think of learning as a social process, then being a professional and, and, and developing as a professional is really uh, 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 negotiating an identity in interesting ways because uh, all of us, really are you know, crossing boundaries all the time, uh, uh, um, identifying more or less with certain communities. Um, and I would say in response also to, to, to what uh, George was saying earlier, or someone was saying about sort of multi-membership. Uh, one way to think about learning in the modern world is that, you know, if you live with one community, then the community will do a lot to shape your identity, right? But if you live at a crossroad of multiple communities, in some sense, the burden of defining what it means to be knowledgeable is it's more on the person. You see what I'm saying? Because there is, not, there is nobody who is, a, who is fully a companion because of your unique trajectory through that complex landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that uh, one characteristic of knowing in the, in the 21st century is that it's a matter of modulating your identity with respect to, to a series of communities and that is more of a burden on the person. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, also talking to Fred Garnett, also the um, uh, just with globalization and the, the way we travel, 
and the way that our personal and professional lives cross up, I, w I would say it's getting more, 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 more complex. Uh, the the modulating our de our identity in mu multiple communities. So uh, I think that we're coming to an end, to the end of our time. Um, it might be good. Actually, one thing we wanted to we wanted. Uh, there's not going to be much time for it, but we wanted to hear some stories of of other people here uh, who had uh, seen something like uh, 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 an, an, a higher ed uh, uh, program that was focused on genres and on on a direct experience of a genre uh, in the in, in the way that uh, that Bev was describing it. May I just just speak? So, briefly interrupt in respect of time. Briefly I, I, I certainly don't want to cut the conversation short. And thank you, Etienne, for noticing that we were coming up to the end of the scheduled time. Um, I suppose that what the, the democratic way would be to ask sort of for a show of hands in the room. I'm certainly happy to keep this going for another half hour or so, if that's uh, if that's the willingness of uh, of Bev and Etienne as well as the as well as the room. So, is anybody that wants this? Uh, I mean, that's first Etienne and Bev. Do you mind carrying on for another uh, sort of 20, 25 minutes, minutes or, so? or so? Well, we've got the we've got another meeting coming up, so that might be a little long. Okay, uh, okay. I, I just uh, don't, I, want I to don't want to uh, cut you short if you've got, you 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 got some time. So, yeah. I, I, so make it about, I, I make it about 18 past 20 past. 18 past 20 past. If we go yeah, to... I mean, I mean we, can, we can go on to that half hour. Yeah. So we should go on until, so say, we should 22, go on until say, 22, 20 before the hour. 20 before the hour, which is... The hour, which is Five o'clock here. Okay. Five yep. o'clock here. Uh huh. That will work. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll go to uh, we'll go to uh, sixteen forty. Forty. Okay. That's just if somebody has a story. Maybe somebody never maybe nobody does have a story. <laughs> but we're interested. In, we're really interested in hearing them. Yes. I know. I know. Fred has. I know. I know Fred has lots of stories. Okay. Because, because we, we feel that in education, uh, the theory has been taken up a lot for professional development, uh, but not perhaps as much as we would hope for curriculum design and course design. Um, so we would like, uh, for me it was so exciting to, to visit Hong Kong and to see a major university taking that really seriously. and. Uh, uh, on a trajectory to do it across the university. Um, so, we would love to hear other people's stories. I wonder. Just grab the mic. I wonder. I wonder if there, there are national, there, national, there cultural there issues. national cultural issues. Because it, my because university, the, my university in the UK, we are involved in quite a substantial institution-wide curriculum transformation initiative um, around the concept of graduate attributes. But implicitly what it does involve is moving from a very individualized sense of the ownership of the content of any given course module to a much more collective or collaborative sense of the ownership of the outcomes of an overall program. And this in the UK is sometimes characterized as a country that has a sort of very high indices of individualism, very low indices of collectivism. I'm not sure how true that is, but we certainly do get a lot of resistance uh, to the um, collective development of curriculum and uh, maybe it's maybe it's just a sort of a, a period of transformation. But I wonder whether there's a there's something in the national culture that resists um, communities of practice at, at, in some circumstances. Well, 
I, I don't know if you were talking about uh, the collective development of curriculum among teachers, or if you were talking about, you know, what what Bev was was saying about anchoring a course in an understanding of the genre of a practice and giving students a full experience of of engaging in that genre. Um, oh, good and, question. And, and, uh, good question. Um, I was and of course, more the, genre, the genres of practice are, are not so individual. Uh, most practices are uh, collective, including the health sciences, where you know people are part of, of of operating teams and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I think that's a very very useful distinction for teachers in higher education. I mean, I was thinking of teaching in higher education as a community of practice, course teams as a community of practice, that, at, at that level of organization. And I wasn't going beyond that to thinking about anchoring the practice in the genre of the practice for which um, people are being prepared. However, uh, something that strikes me immediately is the problems with um, the, the communities of practice. There are some disciplines in higher education which do prepare people for taking up roles in recognizable communities. But a very high percentage of people in undergraduate education go into roles which require a general sense of graduateness rather than the particular skills of a historian or a English literature or uh, choose, choose your discipline as you wish. There are very vocationally oriented disciplines for which that works, but there are other more sort of, um, um, I don't know what you'd call them, sort of knowledge oriented disciplines perhaps for which that model might not be as accessible. That'd be quite true, but, but like, actually we were just helping our son here um, with, with biology. And, you know, he's in a good school and, and you know, all power to his teacher for trying to help him uh, uh, understand biology, but we were feeling like what, what he was learning was not giving him an experience of the genre at all, you know. There was like a lot of terms that he had to learn about this little piece of a cell and that little piece of a cell. And it's like, you know, if the school had decided that, you know, we had too many biologists and we should make sure that our students don't study biology, they couldn't do a better job, almost. <laughs> you see know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because, I'm laughing. Yeah, I'm laughing. <laughs> because it was like the experience was so remote from any kind of genre that would be characteristic of, of biology that, yeah, I think that he has a completely wrong idea of what biology is about. Of what it means to be in biology. Yeah, yeah. That's what I appreciate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, talk about, we, talk about, we talk about three different about kinds of authenticity. Of authenticity. The, uh, authenticity, the uh, to authenticity to the point of origin of the, learner. Of origin of the learner. Authenticity to, authenticity the, to the knowledge base of the discipline. Knowledge base of the discipline. And authenticity, and to, the authenticity of being to the practice of being in the discipline. In the discipline. And often these are and often these are with one another. With one another. That one possibly that cannot one possibly cannot transit immediately from transit immediately from from authentic from to the authentic starting to the, point. The starting point. To a sense of what it might mean to, to, be, in the mean to be in the discipline. And that's one of the challenges of teaching, teaching in higher education. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that it's precisely the kind of challenge that, that our theory would, would, would put in front of teachers. It's like, you know, can you, because, you know, many students of our courses will not become practitioners. We will not become full practitioners of, of what we teach them. So, you know, my, my son there is not going to become a biologist, most likely, uh, maybe, but, you know, the point, the point is not to make him a biologist. 
right? So the point is to, you know, give him a sense of what this is about, so that he can make meaning with that in his life, moving on. And so I think, I think it does create a challenge for educators to say, okay, well, the, so there are uh, professions where you are really learning to become an architect, okay, and so you become involved in a project that's architectural. But uh, as you said, there are all these other courses that are given to people where they are not going to become full practitioners themselves. So, you know, how do you give them an experience, a meaningful experience of, uh, of engagement without requiring to, I don't know, to do all the detailed grunt work that an actual practitioner would have to do. And to me, that's, that's really a, a, an educational challenge. Because I, I, one thing I want to tell you is that one of the, one of the reasons we were interested in communities of practice originally in this apprenticeship thing is because in apprenticeship we noticed that meaning was a driver of, no, of learning. You know? So if you're an apprentice tailor in, in uh, uh, West Africa and you are, you're sewing a button on, on the dress, the technique that you are using is meaningful because it is part of a way of being in the world that is that is imaginable because you are engaged with it in that in that community. You see what I'm saying? So meaning is driving learning. Meaning is driving the acquisition of skills and knowledge and, 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 and information. And I don't know, in a, I think in, in a lot of our education we, we have we have given given up this responsibility for meaning. And we have focused on the technical aspect of of learning. I think I think it's uh, I think it's an abdication of, of educational responsibility that's terrible. You know? And I think uh, these people in Hong Kong and I was talking with them, they, they were saying we need to recapture that responsibility of, of, of looking at all the aspects of the profession and engaging our students in an experience of all the aspects of the profession, including the political, and ethical, and social aspects uh, of, of being an architect, for instance. And I think probably you were doing the same with, with English, with learning English, you know, kind of focusing on the, on the person meaning of being able to talk, as opposed to simply the technicality of vocabulary and grammar and stuff like this. That's where the consideration of that's where the, the consideration uh, community of as uh, genres, uh, community as uh, genres, so so powerful a concept becomes so so powerful a concept. Whether mm -hmm. it's powerful for whether it's powerful people for people haven't had a sort of linguistics background, people haven't had a or sort of linguistics or English lit or. A, is another question possibly. Well, I mean, I mean, the term genre comes from from sort of literary criticism and, and, and things like this. But I think it's very applicable to the notion of a committee of practice. Right? That there are there are identifiable genres within a practice. And understanding those genres, and then designing a pedagogy that is accountable to an experience of the genre, I think that is that is really an interesting challenge. And this is why we were hoping, you know, in this uh, um, in this talk, to have uh, some stories of people who have tried to do that.
I like very much the idea. I like very much the idea of pedagogy being accountable to the experience of the genre. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving a talk on Friday on what's described as a pedagogy of e-learning, and I think I'm going to try to weave that weave that right in. Indeed, um, I, I do think that literacy as a function of uh, community and identity is quite uh, quite a challenge for us because. Obviously, um, literacy, as Fred has mentioned, is often just sort of taught as a deficit model. You need to learn the grammar, learn the rules, apply the rules, and hey, presto, you're literate. But literate is about being um, understood within uh, communities of language users, or indeed within genres. So you, you may have a, a good understanding of a particular practice, but somehow not be able to speak it in the language, if I can use that term, of the community of practice. And until you can speak within the community, until you can enact your identity through the expression of meaning in a community, you will always at best be a, a, a peripheral participant, if I can use that term, and not move into the core of the community of practice. That for me is one of the, is I agree, one of the more uh, powerful challenges to teachers in higher education. I still think it's um, problematic when the um, aim, if you like, is to produce people who are generically graduates and, and whatever that sort of broader community. Is there a community that is, uh, could be characterized simply as university graduates? Is that a community? I mean, in, in America, you have those sort of parody statement, rich man goes to college. You're breaking up, George. George, have we, have we lost you? Ah, here we go. Ah, here we go. OK, well, you're back. Good. Um, I was talking about access to that cultural identity of being a graduate, whatever that might mean. Whatever that might mean. And as opposed and to as member opposed of a to more, narrowly of more narrowly constructed community. Constructed community. Well, but I don't think the two are, are that different uh, because because you become a graduate by visiting. Think of, think of learning as a trajectory, a journey through a landscape of practice. You want to be able to visit. You, know, you, you don't become a tourist by looking at maps, you know? And so... Indeed. Indeed. And, and so... I, I, I don't think that, in fact, we, we think of, of general literacy or general kind of education in terms of acquiring stuff, you know. But I think what we are proposing is much more like a journey. What's the student journey through the world? What have they visited? Where have they been, you know? And that may, imp that may mean certain techniques that they have to, to acquire in the process. I think, I think the student that, that Bev was talking about, they were acquiring lingu linguistic skills like some, some grammar and some vocabulary. But they were acquiring so much more. They were also thinking about how learning English is a way to communicate to international people to go beyond Portugal. You know, I mean, it was like, giving the experience of the techniques uh, a level of meaningfulness that was very different. So you may think, oh, but this is very specific to a certain community. They may sh it would be better to give them general skills. But those general skills don't become meaningful unless they are part of an experience of, of, of engagement. So I think that 
when we think about the graduate as, a, as something we want to achieve in higher education, I think we would, we would be well served by thinking about graduate, the state of graduate as someone who has visited a number of places in the landscape as opposed to simply someone who has a certain amount of information in their head. Uh, Etienne, uh, Etienne and Bev, and Bev, uh, given that we're coming up on the time that I suggested that we, we might extend and that you have to be somewhere else, that seems to me like a lovely statement with which to bring this part of the conversation to an end, that uh, it's finding oneself in a landscape, that, that, that the idea of a journey across a landscape of practice is what the higher education experience is about. Uh, can I just ask uh, my colleagues Jenny and Marion whether there are other points that they would like to bring up? I think there's just an awful lot there to think about. Thank you, Etienne and Ben, very much. Um, I've been making notes through this session, and um, I'll definitely be reflecting on a lot of what you've said, and I'll be thinking about why your son doesn't like studying cells or doesn't find it meaningful, because um, uh, biology was one of my subject. It was a degree subject. So um, I'll, be, I'll definitely be reflecting on that. So many, many thanks to both of you. OK. Thanks, Jenny. I'd just like to add to Jenny's thanks. Jenny's thanks. Um, lots to um, reflect lots upon. To reflect um, upon. Found um, you found you the whole session very whole inspiring. Session very inspiring. Smart. Thank you. Smart. Thank you. Yeah, and we wanted to end by putting a plug in for our uh, workshops. Um, so this this summer we're going to have a series of uh, uh, workshops, uh, both face to face and uh, in in California and online for those who, who uh, don't want to or cannot travel. And um, that's when we reflect on what we are learning, on on its implications, and so on and so forth. It's it, it's our own yearly reflection, but we invite uh, others to join us. So that's um, so an invitation, really, uh, if anybody's interested. I, I think Jenny is, I, able, I think to Jenny is able to provide an endorsement. Provide an endorsement. <laughs> Yes, I would definitely, yes, I would definitely recommend this. Recommend um, this um, if you go to Etienne go and to their Etienne website, and their website um, type, um, in Betreat, type in Betreat, then you'll then see that they are offering um, more than one Betreat. Uh, last year I went to California for one of their Betreats and spent a week there with them. Um, very, very memorable um, experience, which I'm still reflecting on. And this year, I've signed up to join them online for their academic retreat. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what it's like from the non-face-to-face -face, um, uh, participation element. So, so do have a look at their their website. There, Fred's put it in. Do have a look and have a look and see what uh, they're offering there. Uh, lots and lots to learn. Thank you to both of you again. Yes. Yeah. And if I can uh, repeat and reiterate, thank you very much for joining us, Bev and Etienne. If uh, all of the participants remember the use of the smileys, we can click on the little smiley face and give a round of applause using the uh, using the tools of the, this particular trade. Excellent. Well done. Um, and and. I think that it only remains to say that this conversation hasn't, uh, hasn't ended. This is an ongoing conversation about the meaning and purpose of higher education. Um, Etienne and Beverly, but thank you ever so much for bringing your rich experience, uh, knowledge, and analysis of many communities of practice to this, this conversation. Um, so uh, unless there's any final words, uh, I'll say thank you very much. Um, from the MOOC perspective, people will be um, 
moving into the the assessment room. I'll put the link up to there. Oh, it says Jenny says Mary has a question. Uh, does Mary have a question? No, I think she's uh, taken her hand down again. Thanks, George. Uh, it might have been raising the hand as applause. Yes. Um, okay. Um, Etienne and Bev, is, uh, thank you ever so much again. And for participants in the MOOC who are doing the uh, assessment strand, let's see, this is, uh, let me copy the link location. Uh, those, those who remember can uh, move over into this <laughs> lovely URL there. Um, and for everybody else, we'll see you in the discussion forums. Uh, I've noticed Dave White has been in the room today. Uh, Dave, are you still there? Yes, Dave says yes. Dave's going to be giving our final uh, guest uh, talk in this MOOC next week on um, the impact of open educational resources on, on academic practice. We look forward to that very much. And then the week after is going to be showcasing the work of all of the participants in their, their micro teaching. So uh, over, over to the assessment strand, those who are doing this for assessment, I uh, look forward to everybody's readings in the, um, in the discussion forums. And thank you all very much. Yes, thank you for having us. That was, that was really interesting. I hope that we were able to communicate across the technology. Uh, so that was, that was really nice. I think you communicated very effectively across the technology. Um, there is a genre to the use of um, illuminate, uh, collaborate these virtual rooms. And I think there's a the cultural proficiency is growing. Uh, I think Sylvia, Sylvia is not here, she's left, but she's to be thanked for providing us with a stable platform. Um, this this uh, has failed less frequently. I mean, in fact, it hasn't failed at all. I think this has been a really excellent installation of, um, of, of Collaborate. Okay. Hey, thanks, George. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Etienne. Bye-bye, Beverly.